Jerusalem, 1891. The young couple, Eliezer and Deborah ben Yehuda, immigrated to Eretz, Israel, and lived in Jerusalem. The young pioneer's dream of a reunited Israel and the restoration of the Hebrew language. Deborah died of tuberculosis in 1891. Nearing the end of her life, she wrote a final letter to her younger sister, Pola, in Moscow. The last sentence of her letter reads, If you want to be a princess, come to Jerusalem and marry my prince. Six months later, Pola arrives in Jaffa. She now adopts her Hebrew name, Hemda. I can hardly believe that she's here. She knows about my tuberculosis, from which her big sister died, infected by me. But to my great joy, despite all of these bleak prospects, it doesn't stop her from marrying me. She will become an indispensable help by my side. Gottfried Bula traces Ben Yehuda's life in Jerusalem. He wants to find out more about this unique man who was set out to reawaken the Hebrew language. Gottfried Bula looks forward to a very special encounter. As the first German television moderator, he gets access to the house Eliezer and Hemda move into with their growing family. I am now here in the house where Eliezer ben Yehuda lived with his family for the last few years of his life. This house was bought by the Friedenberg family a few years after ben Yehuda's death. And I am now here with the grandson of the Bayer family, Benjamin Friedenberg. The extraordinary thing about the Friedenberg family is that they have placed great importance on leaving the house in its original state. So Benjamin, thank you very much for your time and actually letting us in in your living room because you're living there in this house, it's not a museum. How is it for you to live in a house from such a, let me say, famous person? Well, uh, it's an honor uh, to live in this house and to have this historical place to be uh, preserved by my family. Uh, we're not related to the Benyuda family, but we, we would like to preserve the, the house as it was. Um, and if, even if it's a private home, we try to keep the, the historical story here. Ben Yehuda became very famous um, about reviving a dead language. What do you think today, um, 70 years after the establishment of the new state of Israel, speaking Hebrew? Well, this was a huge project that really um, was engraved in uh, Israeli society and was really a huge part of, of the state reviving the language and let everyone uh, talk uh, this language and create a common, um, common denominator between people who came from many, many countries. And it was um, a very important project, a very interesting one, I think a very unique one in world languages. He studied 24 hours a day and he read thousands or ten thousands of books and um, he had to deal with many obstacles. 
what do you think or why do you think he um, succeeded? Well, it wasn't as, as easy in the beginning. I mean, he succeeded because he had, I think, a lot of, uh, a lot of power around him. It wasn't just him. It was a project of many, many people. Uh, he was one of the leaders. And I think what, uh, what really helped is that the system of the schools and how children are, are learning the language was, uh, was uh, thanks to his to his project, I mean um, the his project was really reviving the language and bringing uh, words uh, and vocabulary from other languages to the the old biblical uh, Hebrew. He was working very close with um, the people in Rishon LeZion, and they were asking the children in, in the school classes when they needed a new word. For example, how would you name the word um, Eisenbahn, for example? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was a project that was um, coming together. That I think what's interesting about Hebrew that it, it really uh, evolves very, very fast till this day. Every language goes through uh, a long process of development. Uh, in Hebrew, you have a language that was revived and now going through a lot of changes that other languages are went through in, uh, in hundreds of years. And, and in Hebrew, it really a very short time. Uh, you have from biblical to modern. Um, and it's, uh, it's really fascinating. Children learn Hebrew at school for the first time in Rishon Lezion, the first settlement founded by immigrants from Eastern Europe. If new words were not accepted by the children, another word had to be used. My idea to establish Hebrew as an everyday language through education, in the end, was very successful. However, it was a long and difficult road to travel. The Hebrew language has a root in every word. We don't know that in our German language. What, what is the advantage or the, the meaning behind that? So the, the root system is very common among uh, Middle Eastern languages, especially Semitic languages here in this area. And uh, it's a very fun and creative system where you have uh, three, four consonants constructing together a word. And the semantic field around it is created from this root. In the Bible, you have the word light in Hebrew, O. So many, uh, many of the words relating to light are coming from the same uh, root. And um, menorah, which is the candelabra, uh, is the same word as, as light coming from the same root. So you have uh, in the center you have uh, words coming from uh, the same root, and it's very creative. Even with some small successes, Ben Yehuda understands something more fundamental needs to happen to establish Hebrew as an everyday language. We urgently need an up-to-date Hebrew dictionary. We try to teach people a language for which there is no reference book. There's not even a Hebrew word for dictionary. So we have to create a word for it first, and then the dictionary itself. It is a colossal endeavor, but I have to do it. At the Academy of the Hebrew Language in Jerusalem, Gottfried Bula discusses Ben Yehuda with Professor Stephen Fassberg and Dr. Gabriel Birnbaum. Talking about the dictionaries, uh, how was the work or, or the creation of his dictionaries? It was published, by the way, by a German publishing house. Lang Langescheid. Langescheid. Yes. This is also a miracle in a way, because he did it himself first. He, he, he actually almost didn't have, he had some people who helped him, but even when he told people that I'm going to, to compile a dictionary of all the strata of Hebrew, 
They again, they said, nobody did this before. You can make a, a dictionary for the Bible, a dictionary for the Mishnah, but the dictionary encompassing the whole of the Hebrew language yourself. But he was a man who said, if we need it, I'll do it. And he started to do it. He started, and actually, in his lifetime, only five volumes were published. But two volumes were already, actually, they were ready. They had only to be published. He went around from library to library looking at manuscripts, mm -hmm. ancient Hebrew manuscripts, and see the Hebrew preserved in those manuscripts as he could to insert them into his dictionary, which was uh, to be a historical dictionary of the entire Hebrew language. So he, he went from capital to capital looking uh, for more material for the dictionary. And actually, the, the years of the First World War, 14 to 18, he spent in New York. He had to be there. There was different uh, reasons, so he was there. And he did a, a large amount of his uh, dictionary he wrote there. So there, of course, there were more libraries than, than, uh, than there were here those days, and more manuscripts and more material. So he could advance quite well there. The First World War breaks out in 1914. During the war, Eliezer and Hamda ben Yehuda live in the United States. However, as soon as the war is over, they take the first opportunity to move back to Jerusalem. There, ben Yehuda begins building a new house for his large family. He, however, shall not be able to inhabit it himself. Today, the house is in German ownership, and Gottfried Bühler visits the house to find out more about it. We meet Ingrid Enat Lavi. She has been living in Israel since 1981. She is married with three children and lives in Jerusalem with her family. So, Ingrid, vielen Dank for your time. Ingrid, thank you for your time. It is a great honor to be here. What is it like for you to work in a house that has such important historical significance? Yes, I'm really aware of this fact. It's wonderful to work in such a beautiful place, and it has been for many years. And then there is the ambiance of it being Eliezer ben Yehuda's house. Eliezer ben Yehuda could never live here, but he did lay the foundations. So, did he design the house? Eliezer ben Yehuda did raise the funds for this house. It was his dream to build it. He planned and designed it together with the Templars. Of course, he was present at the laying of the foundation stone and continued to follow the construction. The special thing about the house, obviously, is the fact that his work could be continued here, which was the completion of the dictionaries that he started putting together. Yes, the office was on the top floor, and all of his papers were stored in that office. Hemda, his wife, continued to work on it because it was very important to her to continue his work and to finish it as far as was possible at the time. What do you think about the fact that there was a man who revived a language that was believed dead? It's just fantastic. At the present time, it is totally normal for people to speak Hebrew, that Hebrew is the colloquial language. But at the time he started, it was still revolutionary. Incredible the job he has done. You came to Israel in 1981 as a German, and you had to learn this language that Ben Yehuda revived. How was that for you? Yes, that was really difficult. Learning Hebrew has not been easy because every Hebrew word has a completely different sound than the words we know from German, English, or French. So it was not easy to learn Hebrew. It is even more difficult to write because most of the letters you don't write. Most of the vowels are not written at all. 
His wife Hemda moved in here after the death of Eliezer ben Yehuda. Her main work was to complete ben Yehuda's vision, namely to finish the dictionaries that he had started putting together. Did she finish this job? She did a very large part of the job because it was her dream. She very much appreciated Ben Yehuda for his work and commitment in this task. And she's taken on the obligation to continue his work. She didn't finish it, though, for there will always be new words. There are many more words today than there were in her days. And there were many more words in her days than there were in biblical times. Hence, the dictionary is still alive, but she has contributed a very large part to it. The First World War changed the Middle East forever. In December 1917, British troops under General Allenby marched into Jerusalem. The Ottoman Empire is defeated. After the Balfour Declaration in November 1917, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the decision of the League of Nations in San Remo in 1920 to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine, Ben Yehuda immediately recognized the scope of these events. After nearly 2,000 years of diaspora, an independent Israel on its ancient home soil is within reach. They have signed in San Remo. Israel is alive. We will live in justice, we and the stranger among us. We will watch over the holy sites of others as if they were our own. Israel was dead, but now it is alive again. The new High Commissioner for Jerusalem, Samuel Herbert, who is a Jew, reads the well-known lines from Isaiah at his inauguration at the Herva Synagogue. Comfort, comfort my people. In addition to English and Arabic, he introduces Hebrew as the new national language of Palestine. No other has worked so hard for so many years in order for Hebrew to be spoken again in the streets of Jerusalem, Haifa, and Jaffa. Ben Yehuda's dream of establishing Hebrew as an everyday language has come true. However, he should not see his dream of an independent state of Israel being fulfilled during his lifetime. In 1922, his tuberculosis worsens again. This time, though, he should not recover from it. Eliezer ben Yehuda dies on December 16, 1922. Over 30,000 people accompany the pioneer and the tireless Zionist on his last journey. He is buried on the Mount of Olives next to his first wife, Deborah. We have to have a Hebrew language in which we can talk about everyday life. It will not be easy to revive a language that has been dead for so long. These are the words of Eliezer ben Yehuda, at whom's grave I am standing here on the Mount of Olives. And I think it is fair to say that the revival of the Hebrew language is nothing less than one of the great wonders of the modern era. Do you think that the two stone plates, the Torah, was written in Hebrew? <laughs> There's no doubt about it. The Hebrew language is the foundation for the scriptures of the Bible. 
Even if the script has evolved over the centuries, the language remains the same. It was the language of the patriarchs and of the prophets. It has been preserved by Jewish scribes for thousands of years. Without them, there would be no Bible today. Even with the New Testament, some church fathers tell us that the Gospel of Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. The letters were different from the letters of, of our Hebrew, what we call the ancient Hebrew, or the, the Phoenician script, that was those days. The only, the R script is only from about 400 BCE, you know, the, which actually was the Aramaic script which uh, people adopted. But it's the same language, it's of course. The language, yes. It's the same language. It is the same language since uh, 2,200 years. Students can read it. Students can read it uh, quite easily. Uh, because, as Gabi said, uh, the alphabet they use is basically the alphabet we use today. And uh, during the Second Temple period, around 400 or so, we find that the uh, Judeans or the Jews uh, adopted a slightly different type of alphabet, which was related to the older alphabet. And until this day, we still use the same version. Do you think for Christians worldwide it would be helpful to study Hebrew, to understand more about the Tanakh, about the Bible? Definitely to better understand the, the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, you have to understand the language in order to understand the nuances. Yes, I think everyone should study these works in their original, in their original tongue. What would Ben Yehuda say if he could see Israel in these days? Well, I, I think on the one hand, I think he would be very uh, proud that everyone speaks Hebrew and it's a very developed language. So would you say that Christians all over the world, it would be um, helpful or a big advantage to learn Hebrew to, to understand better the Bible? Totally. I, I, I recommend that um, highly to, to study Hebrew um, and to, uh, I think language is culture and, and tradition and I, I think one can understand more uh, his or her's religion if uh, going back to, to the origins of, of the scripts. Would you agree that the knowledge of the Hebrew language is helpful for Christians worldwide to better understand the Bible? Most definitely. I was fairly well grounded in the Bible before I came here. But I really got a completely different understanding after getting to know at least some Hebrew. To have some knowledge of Hebrew is definitely an asset. Hardly anyone would have believed 150 years ago that the Hebrew language, the language of the Bible, the language of the prophets could be revived. And today, Hebrew is the national language here in Israel. Fascination Israel has brought to you today an exclusive report. Perhaps this film has encouraged you to get to know more about the Hebrew language, a creative, interesting language, the language of the Bible. And may I ask you, we are on the road here in the country to bring such reports to you. May I ask you to help us with your donation so that we can continue to make programs like this. 
The International Christian Embassy supports Fascination Israel. And if you would like to learn more about this organization, please visit their website, icej.org. For today, I say goodbye to you from Israel, from Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, from the Ben Yehuda Street, with a heartfelt shalom.